we were talking about dimension. So the last thing, uh, so I reviewed the last few things we did. So if, one thing we had proven is that uh, if uh, x is a variety and u in x is open and dense, so that means non-empty, then <coughs> the dimension of x is equal to that of u. Um, okay, so in particular it means that the dimension of variety is a birational invariance. And then uh, so then well if x is a variety and u is an open subset, it follows that it's irreducible. That's a, a, a relatively easy exercise. I mean which uh, okay. <coughs> Um, and uh, so using this we had shown that um, uh, say if uh, x is a variety x in an is an affine variety and uh, f is a polynomial which uh, does not uh, vanish on x, then uh, if I take then every irreducible component of x intersected zero set of f has dimension precisely n minus 1 if dimension of x is n has dimension uh, dim x minus 1. Okay, so this was more or less the last thing we did and now we wanted to talk about the dimension of fibers so which is a so we had this uh, uh, theorem. Well, I call it theorem. I mean, uh, <clears throat> so let f from x to y be a morphism of varieties. Morphism. Assume there's a non-empty open subset. Um, u in x in y such that the fibers over all points in u have dimension n. For all p in u. Uh, then the dimension of x is equal to the dimension of y plus n. So the, if you have a morphism, the dimension of the, uh, of the source is that of the target plus the dimension of the fiber. And this also holds if the dimension of the fiber is only fiber, is only constant or an open subset. So a dense open subset. The, the rest can never be so large as to change the dimension of x. Okay, we want to, uh, I had also stated, I think, uh, a kind of the, you know, what could be converse, I mean, a stronger form of a converse. So that's a theorem on the dimension of fibers. So this says, so let uh, f from x to y be a subjective morphism of uh, varieties. And uh, 
we take n to be the difference of dimension. We know that the dimension of x is a uh, yeah. So <clears throat> okay. So then we have first uh, for all points in y uh, the dimension of the fiber is bigger equal to the difference of dimensions. So it can never be that the, that the dimension of the fiber is, so to speak, too small. So it can only, on an open, on some subset, it will be equal to n, but it will, ne it, and otherwise it will be bigger, but it will not, never be, uh, it can never be that some fibers are smaller than, than most of them. And the second one is that there exists an open subset and there exists an open and therefore non-empty and therefore dense subset u in y such that the dimension is equal to n. And actually, I didn't state that before, in addition, we can assume that the fiber is irreducible. You know, x and y are both irreducible, and the claim is that also the fiber has to be. But this we will not prove. This is a more difficult, you know, this is a, a, you know, something like a converse to this theorem, but a bit stronger. And it's uh, considerably more difficult to prove than, than this. We'll prove this, but not this. Okay, without proof. Okay, maybe before. We do have it. Okay, so let's try to, uh, to prove the first theorem. I mean, this one. So, <clears throat> so we know that uh, the fiber will be a closed subset, so the statement makes sense. We can talk about the dimension. Um, and, uh, so, <clears throat> which will be the maximum of the um, dimensions of the irreducible components. So, is this the wrong? Okay. So, we put um, V to be f to the minus 1 of u, which is an open subset of x. So we can <coughs> now, um, we know that the dimension of u is equal to the dimension of y, because uh, u is an open subset in y, at the dimension of x is equal to the dimension of v. Uh, so the statement does not change if we replace uh, y by u and x by v. So we can assume that u is equal to y. So that means we can assume that for all the points, the dimension of the fibers n. So replacing Uh, y by u and uh, v uh, x by f to the minus 1 of u, so by v, we can assume that uh, the dimension of f to the minus 1 of p is equal to n for all points p in x. Okay. So this story that the statement is only uh, true for, I mean, the assumption is only true for an open subset of y can be immediately removed. 
So you can as well assume that all fibers have this dimension. Okay. <coughs> So now we uh, want to prove this somehow by, by induction over the dimension of y. So prove the statement. But maybe I have to first see. Yeah, prove the statement by induction over the dimension of y. So if y is a point, so if dimension is 0, is a point, there's nothing to show. Because then x is equal to f to the minus 1 of that point. It has dimension n. So that's kind of trivial. So the statement is trivial. I mean, it's actually. So uh, we want to make induction over dimension of y. So for this, we first make another uh, simplification. We want to assume that both x and y are fine, because then we can cut down by hyperplanes to reduce the by hypersurfaces to reduce the dimension. So replacing y by an open defined subset. which still has the same dimension as y. And uh, uh, x by an open affine subset of uh, f to the minus 1 of this affine subset, um, we can assume that x and y are both affine. And uh, <clears throat> affine means, after all, that it's isomorphic to a closed subset of some affine space. Uh, but no dimension is invariant under isomorphism. So we can as well assume that x and y are closed subvarieties of some affine spaces. In fact, x in, uh, I don't know how I wanted it, AL, and y in a M closed subvarieties. So we do this because now we can cut down with hypersurfaces and we know what happens. So given, so now F is now a morphism between a fine uh, subvarieties of a fine space, so it's given by, po by polynomials, as we have learned. So we can write. f equal to, say, f1 to fm, as many as the dimension of the space in which uh, y lies, where the fi are some polynomials in the variables on uh, the space in which x lives. No? That was how morphisms of affine varieties were described. Um, so now, let G be a polynomial uh, here in kx1 to xm, uh, such that um, if I take the zero set of this polynomial intersected with y, we want that this is neither empty nor the whole of y. So z, z of g does not lie in the ideal of y. You can certainly do that. because, uh, And uh, this should, you know, <coughs> and we can also assume that this will not vanish on this. <coughs> Just, uh, you know, we can always find a polynomial which doesn't vanish at any given point. And so we define that. Um, so now we know that 
know, this intersection has dimension one less than y. So we want to use that to, uh, to prove our result. So let y prime be, say, equal of uh, the zero set of g intersected x. And we put uh, x prime equal to the f to the minus 1 of y prime. Then we know, you know, how do we get this? <coughs> so this is just f to the minus 1 of the zero set of g intersected with y. So that means we obtain it by putting f, it is just the zero set of g composed with f. No? Which means uh, x prime is equal to, uh, say, x intersected the zero set of g of f1 to fm. No? The, the, you know, the, the coordinates replaced by these polynomials. So, but this itself is again a polynomial in these, uh, you know, a polynomial in kx1. So this thing, so g of f1 to fm is a polynomial in uh, kx1 to xl, no? So we take the intersection of x with the zero set of such a polynomial. And uh, this polynomial does not lie in the ideal of x because, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, the already here we would have uh, that this is equal to the whole of y. So, no, because, I mean, the zero set is not equal to the whole of x because that would mean that here the zero set is equal to the whole of y. And so we know that uh, by our previous theorems that the dimension of this thing is the dimension of y minus 1. The dimension of this thing is the dimension of x minus 1. So we find that the dimension, which we, how would we want to write it? Not here. So the dimension of x is equal to the dimension of x prime plus 1 by this previous theorem, uh, which is equal by induction. You know, now we can apply the induction hypothesis to the map. So we apply induction hypothesis. So for any, <coughs> so say for any irreducible component of um, uh, x prime, so x tilde of x prime mapping to a corresponding irreducible component of y prime. So <coughs> every irreducible component of, of x, so y tilde of y prime, every irreducible component of x will map to some irreducible component of y because they are irreducible. So it cannot map to more than one. So for any such, we know that the dimension of uh, uh, so that by induction the dimension of x tilde is equal to the dimension of y tilde plus n. No? Because now the dimension of this thing is smaller, is n minus 1. And so uh, we have this. And uh, <clears throat> so thus we can do this, this dimension of x prime plus 1, which is the, the dimension of y prime plus n plus 1. The dimension of y prime plus 1 is the dimension of y. Okay, and so this proves it. So this is relatively uh, 
simple. You know, we just, you know, I mean, we make this number of reduction steps, but then afterwards we just have to cut down by a hypersurface, and then the thing is, uh, uh, and then uh, we know it uh, for the hypersurface, and by induction we get uh, for all. Okay. <coughs> So we give a number of simple applications, which, you know, it's nice to know that this is true. For instance, the dimension of the product is the sum of the dimensions of the factors, which, you know, by the definition does not follow. If you think, look at these chains of things, there's no reason why. Um, so the example, dimension of x times y for varieties x and y is equal to the dimension of x plus the dimension of y. And for this, we just apply this result to the projection to one of the factors. So we take p from x times y to y, say. Then the dimension of the fiber is the dimension of x. And the dimension of the, uh, the target is the dimension of y. And then the theorem applies. Okay. Um, Similarly, we can look at the, the affine cone of a projective variety. So let x in Pn be a projective variety. So we can look at the affine cone. So Cx So you maybe remember this is the set of all points in an plus one whose class in Pn lies in X and um, plus the point zero. And uh, <coughs> so then the claim is dimension of Cx is equal to dimension of X plus one. Well, if I take Cx without 0, this is certainly an open subset, an open dense subset in X. At least if I assume that X is not empty, is an open dense subset of Cx. And we have a morphism from Cx without 0 to X. Um, namely just, we take a point x1, 0 to xn in a n plus 1, and we map it to its class x0 to xn in pn. And, you know, you can show, so <clears throat> it doesn't follow directly from the criteria for what we have, for what a morphism is, but you can also just prove it directly from the definition that this it's uh, straightforward to see that this is a continuous map. The inverse in image of something closed is closed. And you can also easily see if you pull back a regular function, then it becomes a regular function here. I mean, in particular, if instead of x, you take here, uh, say, pn, and here an minus the origin, and then the general thing will be the restriction of that. What? Oh, you got this as a homework. Ah, OK, I forgot that. But anyway, so then you certainly know how to do it. OK. And so, so you have a, uh, so there's no worry about this. <coughs> I also didn't attempt to, <laughs> to prove it. OK. And so. Uh, and then obviously the fibers, all fibers. So what are the fibers? These are all the n-tuples, uh, say a0 to a n, which have the same class a0 to a n. But the equivalence class is by multiplying by a non-zero constant. So the fibers are uh, c, c with, uh, you know, k without zero. The, the fibers are isomorphic to a1 without zero.
No, I mean, you can check this. You know, the fibers, if you just look at what the fibers are, you see an isomorphism with A1 without zero. And so, uh, again, the theorem applies and tells you that this thing has dimension, uh, dimension of x plus 1. And this is an open subset, so the dimension of Cx is dimension of x plus 1. So now we want to get some kind of, uh, maybe that's the last result we want to prove in this form about dimension. We will still go on about dimension, but about the kind of what the dimension of things are, namely a formula, uh, a statement about the dimension of uh, closed subvarieties in A and of the dimension of intersections of, of subvarieties in A and in PN. So how the dimension behaves when you intersect. And the statement is that the dimension will go down. Um, well, I write it down, then I can see. So theorem. So what happened? So let x, so there's two parts. First, the fine case. x and y in An be closed subvarieties. Then um, every irreducible component of the intersection has dimension uh, at most, at least, uh, say, bigger equal to uh, the dimension of x plus dimension of y minus n. So we kind of say something about that in a moment. And the second statement is the one for projective space. So let x and y in Pn be closed subvarieties. So the first statement is the same as before. So every irreducible component of x intersected y has dimension uh, bigger equal to the dimension of x plus the dimension of y minus n. But there is more, namely if this number here is positive, is not negative. So if uh, dimension of x plus the dimension of y is bigger equal to n, then the intersection is non-empty. No. Here, <coughs> there's no prediction about the intersection being empty or not, because I just say something about every irreducible component. If this, the intersection is empty, there is no irreducible component, component therefore the statement is completely void. Um, <coughs> And in fact, you can certainly have two hyperplanes in An which are parallel. And the intersection is empty. So uh, this can certainly happen, regardless of how big the dimension of An is. Uh, but uh, here, you have the same. First, you have the same set about dimensions. But the, if you know, there's not too much room for them, if the dimensions add up to at least the dimension of the ambient projective space, you get it's non-empty. OK, so first, you know, this statement, I mean, it's not so complicated, but somehow slightly easier to remember if you, instead of talking about dimension, you talk about co-dimension. So if uh, x in Pn has, so this is a remark. Huh? has a dimension, say, uh, n minus k, we also can say the dimension, the co-dimension of x in Pn, but I just said co-dimension of x, is equal to k. 
Now this is just the, the, the definition of co-dimension is just the dimension of the ambient space minus the dimension of the thing. So and then in this form, the statement becomes the, in this form, the statement is the co-dimension of x intersected y is smaller or equal to the, to the co-dimension of x plus the co-dimension of y. So when you intersect things, the co-dimension is at most the sum. We had seen the special case for hyperplanes. If you intersect the uh, uh, hypersurface, if you just intersect the subvariety with the hypersurface, the dimension drops at most by one. Okay, so, and uh, this statement here, that the intersection is non-empty, is uh, something which is very special for uh, projective space. Um, where is it? So I didn't actually write this. So, um, <clears throat> So this, uh, the fact that, um, so the fact that uh, 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 x intersected y uh, is not empty if uh, the co-dimension of x plus the co-dimension of y is uh, Well, do I want to say it like that? <laughs> it's more like equal to n. So which is the same as that dimension. So it's not so exciting. Anyway, um, so this means uh, this is special for projective space. So we know it's false for a fine space because we can have parallel lines in A2 and we can have par parallel hypersurfaces in in any a n, but uh, you know even we, for instance, have an, as an example, we find that, uh, for instance, we can we can use this to prove that p one times p one is not isomorphic to p two. So, <coughs> so it's not. <coughs> And this is uh, just very simple. So if we take, uh, so if they were, so I, I maybe write the numbers up, if P1 times P1 is isomorphic to P2, then we would have that this statement holds. So then for any, uh, one dimensional subvariety, any subvarieties, uh, say x and y in P1 times P1, we have that the intersection is non empty. We get x intersected y is different from the empty set because this is true in P2, and this statement about intersection you know, is, you know, an isomorphism will preserve that. But uh, this is obviously not true because if P and Q are two different points in P1, then we can look at P times P1 and certainly and Q times P1. And you know, this is just a product. So you know, P is different from Q. So P times P1 is disjoint from Q times P1. You have just two different fibers. No? This is empty. And obviously, these are isomorphic to P1, each of them. So have dimension 1, and this has dimension 2. So this is the case where this does not hold. OK. So now let us uh, try to prove uh, the theorem. Well, 
Well, a fine, well, it's also, you can, yeah, yeah, you can also do, so if you take a fine space, you can take a point, you know, you can do it like that. It's more, more there are more, many more examples in the fine space where things don't intersect, but you can also make this, uh, I mean, a fine space is an, uh, is an open subset of, of that, and you can restrict to that. That is uh, also okay. So now we come to the proof of the theorem. Um, <clears throat> so it's not so clear so how to do it, uh, but we will use a trick. We will, you know, we know how to intersect with hypersurfaces. So we want to reduce to the case of intersection with hypersurfaces. It's not quite clear. It's not true that if x has co-dimension n, it can be taken as the intersection of n hypersurfaces. It is not true. But we can still reduce it uh, to intersection of hypersurfaces by uh, bringing in the diagonal. So let's see how that works. So use the diagonal, so the trick, so we do one trick. Use intersection, use the diagonal. to uh, reduce to intersection actually with hyper surfaces but even more especially with hyper planes. So with linear hypersurfaces. And so how you know we use the diagonal so we are in the first case so let delta in a n times A n be the diagonal. We have seen that delta is isomorphic to A n. We have delta, small delta, from A n uh, to A n times A n, the diagonal morphism. Which uh, maps uh, A n to delta, so it maps the point P to the point PP. No? It maps uh, and um, and it is an isomorphism onto its image. Okay, and uh, now we see. Well, I expect the statement you can remember. It's not so complicated. <coughs> so, if, so the remarkable thing that we want to use is if we take the inverse image under delta of, uh, say, x times y, or if you want, of, uh, which is the same as uh, the inverse image under delta of x times y intersected delta. No, the, so now with this delta, which is an isomorphism, this thing I claim is just x intersected y. So, I mean, if you just think of it, no, this is the set of all points P in AN such that it gets, gets mapped to x times y under the diagonal map. So such that P comma P is an element in x times y. But that means that P is an x and P is also in y. <laughs> Okay, so this is just uh, obviously the case. Um, and so we see, so thus, x intersected y is isomorphic to x times y intersected delta under the diagonal morphism. Uh, 
and so and this this intersection takes place in a two uh, n. So, <clears throat> well, now I claim that delta can be written as an intersection of hyperplanes. So let's see how. So uh, let's see. So let x1 to xn be the coordinates on the first factor, first a n. And uh, y1 to y n, the coordinates on the second factor a n. So what, how do I describe the diagonal? Well, I claim that then delta is a zero set of x1 minus y1, x2 minus y2, and so on, until xn minus yn. Because uh, the, if I have a point p equal to a1 to an, then uh, the ai are just the, uh, you know, the value of this. And the statement that, the, that you have a point pp means precisely that the ith coordinate on, in the first thing is equal to the ith in the second. So that's just obviously the case. <coughs> so what you see, this is the intersection of n hyperplanes, so n polynomials of degree 1. Now, we had this theorem. So by a previous theorem, we have that every irreducible component of, uh, say, a variety, uh, whatever, C in AN with a hypersurface say Z of F in AN has dimension in big N at most one less than the dimension of Z. Bigger equal to the dimension of C minus one. Namely, there are two possibilities. Either uh, Z is contained in the zero set of F, in which case the dimension is, is equal to the dimension of Z, or it's not contained in the zero set of F, then we know uh, the dimension is one less. Okay? So if Z you have dimension of Z is equal to dimension of Z selected ZF, if Z is not contained, If dimension uh, of C, I don't know why I would write this way around, but anyway, it's okay. Okay, so we can do induction. So if we now would intersect our Z with n different hypersurfaces, the dimension would drop at most by n, because at each step it drops at most by 1. So if we apply this to our situation, so by induction, we have that the dimension of uh, x intersected y which is equal to a mention of x times y intersected delta is equal, is bigger equal to the dimension of x times y, which is the dimension of x plus the dimension of y, 
minus the number of equations, which are n. Okay. And so this, so, and this is actually true not only for this, but for every irreducible component, because the statement says every irreducible component has that dimension. So, uh, so, uh, anyway, so, uh, you see that by induction, every irreducible component, say z of uh, uh, x intersected y, has a dimension of z is equal to the to the dimension of the corresponding irreducible component here. Well, okay. <laughs> I mean, it has at least, <laughs> okay, the notation is not so great, but anyway, so, um, which is this, okay? <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it doesn't always have to be that on the, I think it's obvious, even though, uh, Uh, it's tr yeah okay so now we come to part two so uh, we want to um, now this this argument to the diagonal doesn't work for projective space you cannot say that it's uh, like that but instead you can reduce uh, the state, so we want to prove this by reducing to the case of a fine space. Which is a bit funny because the statement that we want to prove in the case of projective space is actually stronger. So it's kind of is a bit amazing that you can prove something stronger to reduce to a case where that stronger statement is false. But uh, we will see, it can be done all the same. So reduce to one by using a fine cones. So, so we have if x and y in Pn are our closed subvarieties. And by definition, if I take the section of Cx with Cy, this is the same as the, the cone. If just look at definition, this is obvious. So, so everything is compatible. We know that the dimension of Cx is equal to the dimension of x plus 1. Same for x, same for y and x intersected y. So we have this very simple relation. And so therefore we can just say, so let z be an irreducible component of x intersected y. Then c of x of z is an irreducible component uh, of uh, c of x intersected y. And we know that this thing has the correct kind of co-dimension. We know, and the dimension of z is by what we had seen as an example, equal to the dimension of the cone over z minus 1. And we had, on the other hand, seen that this is bigger equal to the dimension of the ambient uh, of uh, the dimension of x of cx plus the dimension of cy minus the dimension of the ambient defined space, which is now a n plus one. Uh, 
and so I, and this is uh, the dimension of x plus one. This dimension of y plus one. Yeah, and uh, here, however, I forgot to subtract one. <laughs> no, the dimension of Cz is equal to the dimension of Cx plus the dimension of Cy minus the dimension of the ambient space, and I have to subtract the one. Otherwise, it doesn't work out. Um, so minus minus n. So minus. Well, I can say minus n plus 2. And uh, then you see this is just equal dimension of x plus dimension of y minus n. So precisely as state as claimed. So this is kind of trivial. Now for the other statement, we want to show that if this number is non-negative, then the intersection is non-empty, which is something which is not true in the affine case. So assume the dimension of x plus the dimension of y is bigger or equal n. We want to show that the intersection is non-empty. Well, um, there's, you know, it's not true. Uh, such a thing if you take uh, a fine varieties, but it's always, you know, if you take any, any such cones, the intersection will always be non-empty because every cone contains a point zero. Hmm. So we know that Cx intersected Cy is not empty because the origin lies in Cx intersected Cy. So every cone, by definition, contains the origin. <coughs> so we know that every irreducible component of Cx intersected Cy has dimension um, what is it? Uh, <coughs> bigger equal to one. No, the dimension of Cx plus dimension of Cy minus uh, n plus one, which is one more the dimension of x plus dimension of y minus n, and so this is at least bigger equal to one. So it follows. That Cx, so you know, we know from this story that the intersection is non-empty. So there is an irreducible component. So the statement that every irreducible component has dimension bigger or equal to one is a non-empty statement. You know, we know it has this dimension. So it's uh, somehow. And uh, so, but it's the, the dimension is not just bigger or equal to zero which would mean uh, that it contains point zero, but it actually is bigger equal to one. So it does not only consist of the point zero. So thus, uh, Cx intersected Cy is different from the point zero. And we know that, <coughs> you know, which after all is just C of x intersected y. So if the cone of something is not just the point zero, then the something is not empty. So thus, x intersected y is different from the empty. Okay. So it's uh, this trick with the cone that they always have to intersect. So the state, the thing that in general was kind of not such a big deal that every irreducible component has to have a certain dimension does not necessarily mean that any such uh, irreducible component exists. But if you are talking about cones, then it will have to exist, and so it always is a non-empty statement. OK. So this was as much as I wanted to say about this way. 
about dimension, but there, <coughs> there is another way of looking at dimension, uh, which is also uh, which is about as commonly studied, uh, used as the one that I use. I mean, a different definition of dimension, which is equivalent to the one we use. And I want to introduce this dimension and briefly explain uh, this new other definition of dimension and briefly explain why it's equivalent to the one that we have used. Okay, but this will be very sketchy. In particular, we uh, uh, we introduce uh, some concepts uh, using some theorems, which uh, I do not prove. But anyway, it's uh, maybe also a nice brief repetition of some of the uh, field theory that you had or something. So anyway, it's dimension and transcendence degree. So, I mean, just as a motivation, so we know that the dimension of x um, is equal to the dimension of y if x and y are birational. We know that because we have seen that the dimension of a variety is equal to the dimension of any open subset. And from this, it follows. So <clears throat> on the other hand, we know that x is birational to y if and only if the function field, the field of rational functions on x, is isomorphic as a k-algebra to the function field of y. So therefore, it must be possible to express the dimension of x in terms of the function field. No? So thus, uh, time x. Uh, so must be computable or determined by kx. And in fact, uh, the answer is that it is equal to the transcendence degree of kx over k. So we, we will see. The dimension of x is the transcendence degree of kx over k. Now, I don't expect that you know what that is, so I have to introduce it first. So what, I mean, maybe you know what it is, but uh, I have to tell you what the transcendence degree is, and then uh, to show you that this will be the case. So I want to introduce this transcendence degree. So this is, uh, I have to say a bit about field extensions. So <clears throat> if uh, say k, let's so let k over k be a field extension. So that just means that Large k and small k are both fields, and uh, small k is a subring of the big k. And um, so, if uh, say a1 to a n are some elements of k, we can look at uh, the field, the extension of k generated by these elements. So, denote k a1 to a n with round brackets, the uh, smallest subfield of k of the large k, which contains the small k and these elements. Okay, it's just uh, what if you want, it's intersection over all these, but you know, it just can be obtained by taking 
Okay, we can look at this. Um, so this is called, um, so this is the called field extension of K generated by, by these elements. And so if there are finitely many such elements uh, such that K is equal to this thing, we say that K over K is a finitely generated field extension. So if there are E1 to En and K such that K is just equal to this, Uh, then we say the field extension is finitely generated. For instance, complex numbers over Q is not a finitely generated field extension. Okay. So let's see. And now we want to come to the transcendence degree. We only do this for finitely many to finitely generated field extension. So let assume we have such a thing. So let K or K be a finitely generated field extension. So that means it's uh, obtained from the smaller field by adding finitely many elements. Um, and now we take some elements, so elements B1, B1 to B uh, N and K are called algebraically independent. Well, if they are not, you cannot get them, B1 to Bn cannot be a zero of a polynomial with coefficients, so over k, or small k, of a polynomial with coefficients in small k. So, so if there is no, say f in n variables except for the zero polynomial because that always would work such that if I take f and I replace the variables by these elements you get zero. So there's no polynomial in several variables uh, that vanishes on them. So this, this is the generalization of the concept of transcendent, because you say, you know, you say an element B in K would be called algebraic if there is a non-zero polynomial such that F of B is equal to zero. And you call it transcendence if it's not algebraic. So you call an element B in K transcendent if there's no polynomial F in Kx such that f of b is equal to zero. And now this is a generalization for more elements. We call them algebraically independent. And it's quite, for the intuition, it's quite good to think of um, algebraically independent behaving very similar to linearly independent in vector spaces. I mean, so the, the formal properties are similar. Obviously, it's a different concept. But uh, there's some, in particular, uh, so, let me, we will be able to talk about something which we call a transcendent spaces. So just to say it again, if B in K uh, is algebraically independent over K, so if it's just one element, if and only if 
is transcendent. Over k. So there's no polynomial which vanishes on it. So if uh, B1 to Bn are algebraically independent, Transcendent, yeah. You know the word transcendent? Yeah. It's after the S is C, no? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. Well, okay, so I'm not so sure about the English, uh, about the spelling. Yeah, I. No, I don't think so. I would write it like that. But it might, you know, you, you have to. Uh, you can check it. I, I would write a Z. With Z? Yeah. But it might be that I'm confused by the fact that I'm German. I cannot yeah. guarantee. <laughs> anyway, it's a, you know, there's no, at least there are no two different concepts where once it's with Z and once with Z. <laughs> okay. So I will, okay, I'm willing to believe you. <laughs> okay, so if these elements uh, be one to be n, these are algebraically independent, uh, then it's easy to see that if I take this field k, so algebraically dependent over, over small k, if I take the field generated by them, that this is isomorphic to the field of rational functions in n variables. So whose elements would just be quotients of polynomials in the xi. Hmm? I mean, <clears throat> that's, it, it basically falls from the definition that it will be isomorphic to this. So, and then finally, a maximal set of algebraically independent elements over small k will be called a transcendent basis. Okay, so this is uh, this definition. And now I get, I do this theorem, which is um, basically a statement that a transcendent basis will always exist. And um, which is analogous to the statement that every vector space has a basis. And also that if you have a set of generators for the field extension, you can choose the transcendent basis from the set of generators which is also a fact that you have for field extensions, uh, for, for, for vector spaces. If you have a, a set of elements which generate the vector space, then you can take a subset of it which will be a basis. Okay, so, <clears throat> so as you see now I have made some compromise. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this is how I will do this without proof. Although it's not particularly difficult, but in, um, you know it takes some f. You know, it's not what we are talking about. So let k uh, 
over k be a finitely generated field extension. So then first, there is a transcendence basis. So there exists a transcendence basis of k over k. And I can choose it as a subset of the set of generating elements. supposed to be set to the end. Okay. Okay, that's now the main thing. Then the second one is that every transcendence basis has the same number of elements. So that every basis you know analogous to the state and world vector spaces that every basis has the same number of vector space, uh, of, uh, which is called dimension of the vector space. So um, every transcendence basis of k has the same number of elements. And this number is called the transcendence degree. OK, as I said, like, uh, and uh, the last one is that if you have a transcendence basis for a field extension, the rest is a finite algebraic extension. So let uh, B1 to BR be a transcendence basis of K over K. I mean, remember that k over k is a finite, finitely generated field extension. Then, uh, if I take k over this thing, this is a finite algebraic extension. Okay, <clears throat> so the so every other element will be algebraic over this, and um, well, so I mean it's just you know have a finitely generated algebraic extension, so it's a finite algebraic extension. Okay, so this is this thing. Uh, I mean, I said I will not prove it, so I don't have to worry about the proof, but it's not. Very difficult, but as I said, it's not what we are concerned with. <coughs> so now we want to use this to, uh, so we want to now start relating this to our thing of dimension. So we want to say that, the, as I said, that the dimension of x is equal to the transcendence degree of the function field of x over k. So let's first see. So let now x be an algebraic variety over k. Uh, so 
So then X contains an open affine subset. And uh, which I call V, and you know, as um, <coughs> the uh, function field for X and open subset is the same, we have that KX is equal to KV. So we can assume uh, that V is a, a closed subvariety of some n. By you know, applying, it's, it's isomorphic to closed subvariety, so we can find isomorphism. So we want to describe uh, Kx. So Kx is equal to Kv, uh, which is this. <coughs> so let uh, x1 to xn be the coordinates on a n and say y1 to y n be the coordinate functions. So just the restrictions of the coordinates to v. Well, you know, then we know that uh, kx is equal to kv is equal to the quotient field of av. And uh, <clears throat> so that's the, uh, and av will be the, the, you know, extension of the ring K by the elements Y1 to, so, by this I mean that, you know, I'm not saying that it's a polynomial ring generated by these. No, you just have K and you add to it all polynomials in Y1 to Yn. They don't have to be all different from each other. No, like we had also before. And so this will then be uh, k y1 to yn. So kx, so we see that this is indeed a finitely generated field extension of k. So now let um, say the transcendence degree of kx over k be the transcendence degree of this thing. Now, the claim is that, um, so what one can easily see, so if x is equal to a n or x is equal to p n, uh, then we know that uh, k x is equal to k x1 to x n. So the field of rational functions in these. The field of rational functions in these variables. And so the transcendence degree is precisely n. So, which happens to be the same as the dimension of a n or p n. And the claim is that this always holds. So, we want to uh, claim the following theorem. So, 
let x be a variety uh, then uh, the dimension of x is equal to the transcendence degree of kx over k. And in many uh, books you find that also as a, dimension, as a definition of the dimension. And for some things this definition of the dimension is easier, for other things our definition is easier. So anyway we have chosen. Now we want to see at least to sketch a proof uh, why this is true, why these two definitions of dimension are equal. So we will prove the next time, so we'll show another theorem. Um, every variety x is birational to a hypersurface uh, in a fine space, so in, say, A to the dimension of X plus 1. Okay? So it's actually somewhat surprising, so it shows... Uh, that uh, this uh, equivalence relation by rationality actually identifies many things because obviously there's a big difference between hypersurfaces and varieties of higher co-dimension. But every variety has an open dense subset which is isomorphic to an open dense subset in a hypersurface in a n plus 1. So that's a, a surprising fact, but that's how it is. And now we uh, will want to, we will prove that the next time, or if you're very fast even today, but I don't think so. And um, now we use this to prove uh, this theorem. So we will, this is next time. So now comes the proof of uh, uh, theorem 1. So, if this is the case, we can assume that our variety is a hypersurface. So, by, so, by uh, this previous theorem, we can assume x in <coughs> an, x is Z of f in A n is a hypersurface. So where f in k x1 to xn is an irreducible polynomial. Okay, so we will want to, we know therefore that the dimension of x is equal to n minus 1. Because we know that the dimension of a hypersurface is 1 less than the dimension of the ambient space. So now we want to show that also the transcendence degree of the function field of x is n minus 1. So let, um, so to show, kx over k is equal to n minus 1. Okay, so we take Just to check so let uh, x1 x2 
xn be the coordinates on an and uh, say y1 to yn in ax the coordinate functions. So we have just seen that in that case we can say that uh, kx is the field generated by the field extension of small k generated by these coordinate functions. And now, first we want to see that these n elements cannot be algebraically independent, which then implies that, the, that this thing is smaller or equal to n minus 1. And that's very simple. If we take f of y1 to yn, this is just the class of f in the ideal of x, in uh, uh, ax, no? which is, after all, kx1 to xn divided by f. So, in other words, this is equal to zero. No, because obviously the class of f is zero. And so, <coughs> uh, and thus, y1 to yn are algebraically dependent. And, you know, so we know that the transcendence basis can be taken as a subset of these elements. And we cannot take all of them, so we can take at most n minus 1. So it follows that the transcendence degree of kx over k is smaller or equal to n minus 1. But we want to prove it's equal to n minus 1, so we are not done. So. So we have to show the opposite uh, inequality. To, to show equality, uh, we can assume that the last variable, xn, occurs in f. I mean, we have a, a polynomial in, variable, in the variables x1 to xn. It will depend on some. It might not necessarily have to depend on all the variables, but will depend on some. It's not a constant polynomial. You know, that, uh, it, then you wouldn't have a hypersurface. So we could, in the worst case, we number the coordinates in such a way that the last one actually occurs in the polynomial. No? So that's kind of trivial. And then we want to show that the previous ones, y1 to yn minus 1, are algebraically independent. Want to show. y1 to yn minus 1 are algebraically independent. OK, so then uh, that means that the transcendence degree is at least n minus 1, and so they're equal. And this is quite simple. So assume they are algebraically dependent. So otherwise, we would have a polynomial in these variables which vanishes on them. So there exists uh, an element g in k x1 to xn minus 1 with g of y1, so a non-zero element, uh, with g applied to these elements is equal to 0. But you know these are just the classes of the 
xi in ax. So this means, in other words, you know, this just means that you, if you take the polynomial and divide by f, you get zero. I mean, you take the polynomial and take its class in uh, the polynomials divided by f, in the quotient ring, you get zero. So in other words, we have the g is in the ideal generated by f. You know, but <clears throat> this is not possible because, you know, what's the, if you take the, the ideal generated by f is, is all the, you take any polynomial, you, you, you take f and multiply it by any polynomial. You know that f itself depends on xn, so every polynomial, if you multiply f by any non-zero polynomial, you get a polynomial which still depends on xn. So the only way how a polynomial which depends on less variables would depend, uh, would lie in the ideals if it's zero. So this is a, so thus we have a contradiction to the choice of G. And so we find that um, therefore in fact, these elements are algebraically independent and the transcendence degree is equal to n minus 1. So thus, um, okay, so maybe I will stop here. So next time we will have to uh, prove this other result, which actually is not so difficult, but looks in the moment rather surprising that every variety is birational to a hypersurface. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's it uh, for today. We meet again on Wednesday, I think.